I like to start with the end in mind in having this conversation. Uh, this is just basic change management sort of stuff, but I think that it's important for us to understand where we go in terms of A&D professionals or folks uh, at the customer location. What we want to try and do is this, is, this is just your basic change management sort of formula here. Uh, the idea is that w the vertical line, what's placed in black, is a duration of time, and the dip in the red is your productivity. So we just have to be on board and understand that productivity will have a dip when change happens. It's, it's just going to happen. So we need to be okay with that. Everybody needs to be okay with that. The idea that there will not be a, a dip in productivity is, is not possible. So the idea in terms of using data, creating a methodology, building the, the course is that we want to minimize the time that it takes to change, and when that happens, the dip in productivity can be minimized. So our goal for the conversation today is to minimize the time frame and to lessen the dip. So we want to move this as far up as, as we can for our customers. So that's the thought into why we need to have this discussion overall. Uh, the other thing that we need to think about always for our is what's in it for me, that sort of with them, if you will, because they could care less about anything other than what they're going to get out of this opportunity for the most part. So it's important to have that sort of in mind when we're thinking about things in terms of a discussion of, of the opportunity that's available for, for the individual. And I say the individual, not the organization as a whole, but every individual needs to be able to understand what's in it for them, for their opportunity. And we'll do a deeper dive in that uh, when we go through change management. So one of the things that we find uh, is that it's important for us to think about this sort of discussion, realigning the space in a way that better supports the way that people are actually working. So throughout all of this research investigation, what we tend to find, what many of you probably already know, is that the space is great for the way that work was done five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but is not working, and we'll prove that through data, for the way that work is happening today, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And so that's the issue that we think resonates with many of the clients in terms of the what's in it for me discussion. Uh, so from a Druckerin sort of state here, this is my bit of formula that I wanted to, to share. Um, the idea is that we want not just to control real estate costs, but we also want to create great spaces, right? So it's not, an, it's not an either or, it's a both and conversation. And I'll sort of use that as my go-to reference from time to time. Um, the thought here is that when we're able to measure uh, the space, the way that it's being utilized, the other opportunity is that we want to continue to monitor it. So think about when you go to a doctor to have your annual or six month sort of health checkup. Uh, uh, we may not be thrilled to go and visit the doctor, but it is quite necessary, and that way we find out sort of what's working, what's not working, what we can improve on. So I like to think about this conversation when we think about what's around the corner, having that conversation with our doctor in order to promote our well-being. The same thing happens with the real estate in sort of monitoring the space to determine the, the well-being of the real estate. So uh, does that make sense in terms of the logic train sort of approach? to that? Okay. So when we do all of this, when we're able to measure the space and then continue to monitor it over time, we think that the organization can then, not, not us as Herman Miller or the dealership, but the organization can harvest the dollars that may not be used to their maximum ability, harvest those dollars, and then reinvest them in another opportunity. Now, it would be great if they used that money to reinvest in Aeron shares, but they certainly don't have to, right? What we want to make sure the organization does, uh, very honestly, is that they're focused on the needs of their organizational business drivers, okay? So the idea that they can reinvest, for one of my clients, it was being able to reinvest in technology, which is severely outdated uh, for them out on the West Coast, which is quite challenging for them in terms of getting lots of uh, new talent to work, particularly in an IT situation. So for them to be able to harvest those real estate dollars, 
dollars, they could then use that money to support infrastructure, in this case technology, for the organization as a whole. So that's what I'm getting to in terms of harvesting and then reinvesting as it makes sense. And it may not be for real estate, it may not be for tables and chairs. That's fine, as long as it's built on the needs of the organization and where they're wanting to go five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So that's the idea. If these things begin to happen, then the thought is that an organization can not only be profitable or productive, but they can do both at the same time. So they can be productive, and when an organization is productive, then theoretically they are profitable as well, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, so that's sort of the, the logic behind the discussion here for us. So make sense, are we good so far? Yep, okay because we have a lot more slides to go, so I hope we're okay right now. So when we have this discussion with real estate folks, uh, facility leaders, they generally will tell us, and I actually think that this number is quite low, 62% of real estate and facility leaders will say that they want to make decisions based on this sort of quantitative data. Well, goodness gracious, I hope that they do. You know, what else are they basing this on? Whatever sort of Bob or Kathy thinks we should do. Uh, so it's nice to be able to understand that people are now wanting to use, and I'm sure that they have for a good while, hopefully, real numbers and sort of making the decision. So understand that in a room full of folks that are kind of on board with this already, other people around you tend to be supportive of this as well. And again, I think that this number is low, so it's, it's growing in my opinion. Um, for today, for today and, and all days, I think that it's important to have some assumptions about the workspace, uh, about the physical place, the environment where people go to on a regular basis. And if we can't get past these assumptions with either folks at our organization or if you're an A&D professional, the clients that you engage with, then it makes the, the further discussion quite challenging for us. So these are just some of the assumptions that I think are important. The workplace is a strategic tool. If, if folks don't believe that, then that's quite concerning, right? It's hard for us to get to the next step in the process if they don't believe that the workplace is a strategic tool. The other part of the conversation is that work tends to impact many parts of, a, of an individual and an organization's well-being. There's a great book, I think I should be over here so that you guys can see. There's a great book by Tom Rath called Well-Being, and each of the sections of that book go through these particular topics, career, social, physical, community, and how work impacts these particular things. It's not a Herman Miller book. I love it very much, though, so I talk about it. Uh, Tom Rath also has a very good book called Vital Friends, which I may mention again as we go through the presentation. Presentation. But this is sort of what we're seeing in terms of the physical space, the people that work in the environment, and those connections. So when we have difficulty or challenges from colleagues, uh, sort of non-believers, if you will, I think that offering them this book is kind of a nice nice conversation. So well-being, I think, is good. The other thing that we want to think about is no neutral. So the space is where people go is either great, it enlivens people, it enriches them, they're jazzed about coming to work every day, or it's not. It is the exact opposite. And we've all been in those environments. Now, I'm sure none of you work in those bad sort of places, but you may have at one particular time, and then you moved on to another location. But the idea here is that there is a no neutral discussion. It's it's either wonderful, vibrant, creative, flourishing, productive, happy, significant, or it is the opposite. And that's the, the part that I think begins to resonate with many people because they may be working in the environment that is the opposite of those things that I sort of mentioned. Um, the other thing we find is that people will generally opt out of a poor environment, something that they are not thrilled to be with and will sh be in. And we'll see through the data, I'm not necessarily saying that people are going to uh, go to another organization to work, although sometimes they do, uh, and I'm not ac necessarily saying that they'll just start working from home or that they'll go to Starbucks or I think there are Tim Hortons here also. Uh, so I'm not saying that they're going to do that. I am saying that they will generally find a space within the landscape that they can do the work that they need to do. And that's just what we've seen through both quantitative and qualitative uh, research in this discussion. So good so far? Yep. Yeah? Okay. 
So those are the assumptions for us. In terms of the path, our journey for today, we'll look at it in these sort of three areas. The impact of well-being right, uh, for, the, for uh, individuals overall, the connection to real estate, which is all about the performance of, of the space itself, what it's doing to support that worker and, and moving to a place of prosperity for them, and then the connection of engagement. Personally, uh, so I'm sharing both primary research from Herman Miller, secondary research from myself. My, my own sort of passion is around the, the uh, linkage between engagement and the workplace. So I'm going to share some of my uh, my secondary research on that with you today. Uh, so I like it, so I'm going to talk about it. But the idea about engagement and that connection, I think, begins to, to flourish. And, and, and this is my presentation, so I'm going to talk about engagement. Uh, because I think that it, there's a great amount of connection for it. I promise it's, it's important in terms of where we're going for today. Um, so the other half of this, in terms of why data matters, is sort of the scary part of things. Um, I, I teach in, in Dallas and at uh, Texas Wesleyan University in the business school. I teach consumer behavior and retailing and international marketing and all those other sort of courses. Um, and one of the things that we do in case study work with, with our students is a focus around what's called VUCA analysis. So if you've been in the military before, uh, if, you've, if you've served, uh, this, this came from uh, at the end of the, the Cold War, a military term, VUCA analysis. Uh, we've stolen it from uh, business academic world and are using this in, in our teaching settings now uh, to help students understand what's going on in the real world um, right now for many clients and sort of the, the situations that happen with them. So I like it, so I'm sharing this too. The idea with VUCA, it's just an acronym, is that there's a great amount, as you can see, the, the acronym sort of stands for these sorts of things. So VUCA analysis is the understanding that there's a great amount of volatility that happens within a marketplace. We all know that and sort of what's happening right now in terms of the business world, uh, government influences, all of those sorts of things. There's a great amount of uncertainty in terms of what's happening for uh, many organizations, right, in terms of what's keeping them up at night. That's the uncertainty for them. Uh, I think that this is very helpful also for A&D folks in terms of connecting with clients and having this discussion based on business drivers. Uh, the complexity of the work, so many of our clients will talk to us about the, the great complexity of the daily work that they're doing and how it takes many people to move a process forward. Okay. The last part of this is how things might be a bit ambiguous for them. Right. So if you just take Affordable Health Care Act and sort of everything that sort of changes on a monthly or weekly basis about what's happening with it. That's just one situation out of hundreds that an organization might be faced with. But the idea for us in terms of uh, an academic approach is that we don't necessarily want to stay in this crazy, unsettling sort of world, this, this VUCA world. And we want to move to what we call VUCA prime. Not a Herman Miller term, but I like it, so I, I talk about it. Um, it's this idea of moving from things that are volatile to an aspect of providing vision for um, an organization. And this is what we do in case study analysis. From moving to an aspect of uncertainty to a greater sense of understanding, helping an organization understand what their, what their drivers are and how to meet those drivers. So you need a good amount of clarity, which is the third one, in, in the discussion. So as things become clearer in terms of a path for an organization, hopefully the goal is that they can be more agile, nimble. And it's really what we find as individuals, right? We all have to be very agile to move on to do the next sort of thing in our life. And if we can move from this state of ambiguity to be agile as an organization or as individuals, the idea is that good things for, can happen. So in a case study discussion, we want to point out for folks what are the things that are unsettling or horrific, you know, quite challenging, but then eventually not stay in this area here, but move to a path of a VUCA prime, okay? So getting to a better place is, is what we want to do. So that's why these things matter. Data helps create a greater sense of vision, a greater sense of understanding. It makes the pathway clearer for us, and then we can be nimble in our approach or agile in that discussion.
So these are just some of those things. You have economic issues, you have global issues that are going on, you have you know, war and all of that sort of happen from a global standpoint, and I make, you know, not to make light of all of that, but there's lots of things that are happening. We see what's happening in Ukraine, um, how that impacts, so I was in Seattle, that impacts Boeing because there's a location there in Russia, and so now they're not able to provide as many services, and all of these sorts of things that are happening on, a, on an hourly basis. So with all of this complexity, and we may not understand and how that relates to tables and chairs, but there's a whole great range of things that are happening to our customers, if you're in the A&D community, to your clients. And so we need to be able to understand the great challenges that are happening for many organizations right now and be able to support them based on those changing needs, based on being able to support their business drivers. So that's the approach and sort of this understanding here. So thoughts, comments in terms of why data sort of matters before we get into the trends. Anything, anything at all around this? Are you finding it easy to make that case for, uh, let's say if, you're, if you are the customer and, and you have colleagues? I generally find there's someone at the organization that believes this and then they try and get other people sort of on board with this. Do you feel like that's the case or? or yes, ma'am. This is something that uh, we're working with strongly in the government. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'm struggling to get my superiors on board with is they get the ideas and the concept and the data, right. but what they don't see, you know, and I think I could probably say this just for the government as a whole, is Certainly. dollars. So in the case that, you know, we talk about increasing efficiency, uh -huh. recruitment retention is a huge thing, right. obviously, and, uh, you know, making the workplace more, you know, the benefits of making the a better environment to be in. Mm -hmm. You know, to have some hard numbers saying, you know, some case studies saying, you know, at this workplace we did this and they were able to cut savings by X amount of percent after okay. their, their initial investment cost them this much, their saving, overall savings was this percent, mm -hmm. the recruitment retention was this percent. Good. You know, the, just some just hard savings costs with dollars and cents to be new. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So you know who your APG person is, yes? Okay, good, okay. So Heather will provide you, so we have, uh, there are at least four case studies that I can think of where we've done post work, and I will show you some of the dollar numbers with real clients in the, so I'm sorry, so, um, one of the things is we have folks uh, looking in other, uh, watching the presentation in other locations, so I, I'm supposed to sort of narrate again or, uh, what the question was, and this was around using real data, uh, using numbers to, to quantify the savings from a dollar standpoint in this. Is that, is that okay? Uh, so yes, yes, check mark to that, and I feel like we can do maybe four or five check marks to that based on uh, real organizations. And I've shared that actually not with Air Force but with NAVAC um, in San Diego about, about that. And a little bit at the GSA conference, although military was, um, the branches were not there at the, at the conference that I did. Uh, and that was just Region 9. So um, anyway, yes, we can certainly do that. And I'll show you what some of those dollar amounts look like uh, for some of the clients, okay? Anything else? Anything else? Okay? Okay. So I will be checking up, making sure everybody's...